create with France Sydney. Hello everyone, welcome to the show. This is France Sydney and I help you to create the life you want by looking at all the aspects that you can change because you know we are in charge. And today this is episode 102. On the 29th of July, I will be celebrating two years of podcasting. And so amazing that I spent all this time talking to you guys and having such good comments about my podcast. And I hope you will maybe write a review and click like and share so more people can hear the message that we can take charge of our life. Okay, so let's dive straight in and uh, here I have a question for you today and the question is, do our beliefs affect how we perceive reality? And let's follow by another question. Is it possible that we see what we want and that we ignore what doesn't fit our existing views? Think about it and maybe write about it or talk to me about it. You might have noticed that if you go, say, to a doctor, to a specialist doctor, and you say that you have a pain in a certain area of your body, okay, and depending on which type of doctor you're going, he's going to come up with something that has to do with his training. So if he's a chiropractor, he's going to tell you it's all about your muscles and tendons and posture. Or if he's a person, maybe a surgeon that deals maybe with organs, you know, liver, pancreas, etc. He might say, oh yeah, that's exactly where the liver is. Maybe you have a problem with your liver because that's his expertise. He will tell you that's exactly the point. And then if you go maybe to a quantum energy healer, he will say, oh, that's how you have your stuck energy in there. And if I go to a fourth, a fifth person, they will be filtering what they're seeing through their training. And they will tell you what in their experience it's most likely to be the issue that are all right or they could also also be all wrong because they are seeing reality through their own beliefs their own training and we don't always know that what we see is the truth or what we think is the truth correct me if i'm wrong the subject of how much we are informed by our own experiences It's so important that a guy called Dan Cahan at Yale University, actually Yale Law School, made a whole study about it, and there will be a link. And the study is called Motivated Numeracy and Enlightened Self-Government. So what this guy said, basically, let's, let's see how possible it is that we change our views so much that even maps a maths problem can be seen at a different point of view and is it possible, he asked, that political bias may possibly affect our perception? No, no way. So this is exactly what happened. So um, I'm just gonna call him Dr. Cahan because it's easier. And he picked up 1,110 or 11 participants and he did a lot of tests first of all to see if they have a good ability to reason and a good ability to do maths that was very important also these people had to write in a questionnaire what were their political views by for example party names like i don't know conservatives liberal i don't know what parties they have but yeah <laughs> that's not my forte yeah so he then presented the participants with um, a fake scientific study they came up with data and results And the participants had to answer questions, mathematical questions, about numerical data. And half of this group was told that this study was analyzing how effective a cream was for healing skin rashes. And the participants, who were very good at maths, gave much better results in analyzing the data than the other people who were not very good at maths. However, the other half of the group was given the same identical study, the same data, the same conclusion, but was told that this experiment was actually designed to see if by any means banning guns had managed to reduce gun crime in American cities. And the result was that a significant percentage of liberals performed 
pretty much perfect math when the right answer was that gun control law had decreased crime. But the math took a dive when the correct answer was that crime had increased. And in the same way, while conservatives performed really well when the right answer was that the gun ban didn't work, but a very high percentage of them failed the problem when the right answer was that the ban did work. Interesting. Therefore, we, we can really say that, yes, we do have quite a powerful bias in how we perceive reality. Even when we are intelligent, when we're good at maps, we look at the same data and so on. So we're still a little bit skewed and we are human. So we tend to bend our own perception of the reality even too much what we believe, our assumptions, our ideas. And that is something that happens every day to everyone, even the speaker in this podcast, the host. The host, the myth, the legend, Francis. Just keep it. <laughs> so what is the big deal? You might ask. You know, of course, we all have experiences and therefore we have a different way of looking at what's going on and make, uh, making a decision or a comment or deciding what is good and, and what is right for us. That's normal, isn't it? But there is a problem with that. And this problem is that we might completely ignore the truth of what's actually going on. Remember, the truth is things as they really are, not our ideas, but what actually is there. <laughs> and, and it's not quite what we see sometimes. We might be missing the point because we don't want to hear the truth because it's painful. And another problem is that once we hear something that is not in alignment with our beliefs that we are holding very dear, but then this thing that we find very uncomfortable turns out to be true, then, oh, it really stings to, to say, well, I was wrong, I made a mistake. So is that okay if I say this? Nobody likes to say I was wrong. And nobody likes to go public and say, sorry, I, I've got this completely wrong. We, we have to, to change this. And um, I got this idea that this happens a lot in, in, in politics because politicians are always right, aren't they? And there is a quote I wanted to take from a book about quantum physics by Mel Schwartz. And he wrote this, and I'm just going to read it because otherwise I will make a mess of this. He said that during a 2004 news conference on the Iraq war, a reporter asked President Bush to cite an example of a decision he regretted or an admission of something he did wrong during his presidency. Bush looked completely dumbfounded as he struggled to acknowledge having been wrong about anything. Close quote. So Mel, who is a psychotherapist, wrote that considered that, as a child, the need to be right was likely a major influence in his life. And this is true of so many people, whether due to demanding expectation of parents or humiliating moments in a classroom or being taunted by friends, most of us remain attached to the need to be correct. Close quote for another one. And so I was like, huh? I was absolutely stunned. What the heck? I was just thinking... Wanted to be right has to do with how we were treated as a child. So I really had to find out more because it was quite intriguing for me. And um, of course, you know, we, we notice that people always argue because they all want to be right. And of course, if, if you think about it, all, all the arguments come in from deciding who is right and wrong. And if you think about the large issues of politics, religion, abortion, healthcare, gun control, climate change... Mm, whatever, the wars, don't we all come from discussing and say, no, you're right, I'm, I'm wrong, and oh no, sorry, actually people say always, you are wrong, I'm right, they all come from there. So I was really interested, so I had a little bit of research done to find out a little bit more, because it was quite a topic, and it might come out quite useful for the purpose of creating the life that we want, to realize that um, this bias can affect us. All of us. Incredible. While you're thinking of all the possible places where this bias can start, I thought about a school. You know, school is the right place where we start all this madness about 
the right answer, the wrong answer. When you tick the, the uh, professor, the teacher comes with a red pencil, it's wrong, it's the wrong answer. And you know, the right answer is always followed by a reward and the wrong answer is followed by punishment. And uh, when we know that we are right and we got this right, we feel good about ourselves and we feel happy and proud and we smile. But when we fail, we might blush in front of other people, you know, the students in our class, or we might face our parents later on and we will face the consequences because we have not given the right answer. So it's important for people to be acknowledged, to be intelligent and smart and we are right. And perhaps, my observation, if education were a little bit less constrictive in the school setting, this would not happen because we would be rewarding maybe the, the best question, so a way that is more creative to answer something, or maybe the highest curiosity or problem solving, maybe in groups and not taking one by one. And in a, in a way, many home educators feel that this way of teaching it's a bit more wide and, and organic and, and will encourage a healthy debate and this has helped plenty of anxious children, shy children to stop being so worried about failing a test and giving the wrong answer and to become confident and find a way because they were able just to discuss and not being so worried about failing. So giving the wrong answer being wrong is seen as a failure, isn't it? Tell me if I'm wrong. So maybe Mel Schwartz, the psychologist that was talking about this topic, was very right. We, we look at these people, we think, wow, they really have to be right all the time. Yes, but we as parents and as teachers, when we are running you know, a program, we want the child to know, we want to be able to test this because otherwise the school does not get the funding because there is no exam, etc, etc. We know, I was a teacher for 15 years, I know that there is no funding unless you can prove this learning. Um, but how important this is when we grow up like that, we, we are polarized. Either we are right or we are wrong. And just imagine if we grow up and are raised in a such a way that we think that just one thing is right and we tear down everyone else who is wrong. And as we grow up, we can see, for example, debates when we have politicians on television and they are literally tearing down their position. They have this um, conversation that are very long, very sarcastic, and really, they're not really bringing light about the issue and how they're going to solve it somehow. They're actually just tearing down the other person and say how much they have failed. And sometimes they're very, very rude. And so um, looking perhaps not at the limelight of the television, just couples, sometimes in, instead of trying to be happy, they're trying to be right all the time. <laughs> and so and it is probably a human problem that we have, right? And if we think about it, we all want to be right. And when another person has a different point of view that they have formed with their own life, with their own experience, and with their own conclusions, we see them as because we are right and we differ, so they must be wrong. <laughs> and this is just mind blowing. So I had a little bit of um, meditation and, and thinking about, you know, when we read the news or when we disagree with maybe mainstream news or with something that we see on social media, when we agree or disagree with propaganda or with long-held beliefs, traditional beliefs, or when we prove or not prove something, we notice that sometimes when people go against the big flow or everyone thinks, they are then labeled with insulting names. And sometimes 20 years later, they are proven to be the one they were in the right, but everyone was against them. And then history proved the whole collective society wrong. So that's important how we polarize, we divide, we're not building those bridges. And this can be important when we are building this life that we want. Surely peace is something important in our life. And, and as we go ahead and in the school, in the house, in the workplace, and in the political debate, we keep tearing down others. That's not going to really 
gain us a lot of friends in the long run, nor is going to make us feel very happy because we're going to stand there perfectly righteous and lonely. Uh, because it seems to be impossible for us as humans to ever admit that we have made a mistake. Why is it? Because nobody wants the um, humiliation of accepting a failure. And in our society, especially, you know, um, Western society, industrial society, a failure is something that is not accepted. So I kept reading and reading and asking myself, so why is it that we are so attached to this idea that we have to be right? Could it be that my conclusions were correct? And <laughs> this is all about being right and wrong. Do we actually need to thrive, to be honored, to be respected and to be accepted? So this will be very visible in, in, in our society, maybe in the UK, in America, in Australia, but would it be the same in a little tribe in a faraway country? And it could be that in these modern times, if we are fixated about being always right every single time, then how open are we to learning new things, to challenge our long-held beliefs? And um, is there going to be that our relationships at work and in the home are going to suffer because we just want to be right and we have to correct everyone because we are the expert in something so nobody can talk? That's um, something to consider. Uh, why do we need to be right? I do really think after looking at case studies in my therapy practice that is so important that when we grow up we have parents that don't make us feel that we're never enough some parents are very high demanding and um, it's good to have a good push to do things because sometimes we can be you know lazy as teenagers or as children but when the parents are truly really demanding re demanding and we are never intelligent enough, smart enough, we have to get everything right. And so we see being wrong, making a mistake is a huge failure, maybe suffering from a lack of love that we want, this acceptance. And then if we are not that good in the school environment, we will be humiliated in front of a whole class because we have given the wrong answer. Everybody's laughing. Maybe they will tease us and um, maybe we lose face with others. And so we We work really hard to prove how clever, how smart we are. And we, we can do this, you know, children can be quite cruel when they are very, very small and they can just tease you for anything. And so there is something about trying to connect with a tribe and trying to be just perfect. And this human trait is so common that, you know, we just have to live with that. Or don't we? And so what my conclusion was that, yeah, we grew up like that, the environment is built like that, but what happens is that we, so every person thinks that our own beliefs, our own experiences, and our own theories about everything that happens in the world are the absolute truth because it comes from our brain. And I think the same, whatever comes from a brain is true. <laughs> Why wouldn't they come run, you know, if it came wrong, I would say, oh, what's going on here? And But the important thing is because we assume that everything we have concluded in all these years on, on the earth, in our huge wisdom is true, then at the same time, we might ignore anything they can prove us quite wrong and maybe this will make us think they were a little bit defective not quite as good as we thought imperfect that's the word imperfect so this process that happens in our brain every day um, is called by some people confirmation bias and i divided this in six parts The first is that we first decide what is true regarding a topic, it's just immediate. And the second step is that we ignore any source of information and any data about the topic because we've already decided. Number three, if we do at some point seek for any information about this topic on which we have decided already, we will first check, like the heading, 
that it conforms with our idea. And if not, we will move on looking for something that will confirm our view, because the whole point in this is to prove that we are right. The fourth part is that when something happens that confirms that we are right, we'll tell everyone. We will post it on Facebook, we will put it on a t-shirt, we will sing about it, we'll just bang on this drum over and over and over, triumphantly saying we are right. However, number five, when something happens that is unequivocally obvious, that is proving us wrong, there it is, here's the data, here are the people with a problem, it's happening now, we just forget about the event. We deny it ever happened or we rationalize it in conversation, using maybe something that happened, you know, five years ago to prove that we were right, although the present situation is showing very much that we were absolutely wrong. We just don't want to hear it. And the last step, which could be also the first step, is that we are keeping these wrong premises for our initial assumptions and we do get wrong conclusions. But because the base upon which our argument was built was the idea that we prefer over others, we are dismissing any possibility that we might ever be wrong. So it's like a cycle. And this phenomenon is so widespread that in the next episode I will be talking a little bit more about the idea of what, what does it mean that we are the only right ones and this black and white thinking. But for today, I just want to pause this and let it simmer for a while because, you know, I'm not immune to what I've just talked about. I have a brain too, and any ideas that come from my brain, they're good, you know, because they're coming from me. I made my own conclusions, so my internal dialogue says I'm true, but many times I'm not perfect. And so I'm not right. And for this reason, I realized that because the more educated we are, the more <laughs> we realize how ignorant we are. And so I'm, I'm going on 57 and thinking, gosh, I've got a lot of stuff wrong here. And so I'm spending like an inordinate time, amount of time, just um, relearning lots of stuff that I learned when I was younger and to just try to stretch my brain a little bit and see, could it be that if I listen to opposite views, was there something that I missed? And um, it really helps me to, to see other points of view and maybe reinforce what I believed before making it richer and deeper all sometimes and reinforce that I really have to change because I was quite wrong on, on a lot of stuff. So I'm still biased, you know, and my bias is that I have my ideas and I love my ideas. I'm very attached to them. For example, I still think that chocolate is the best thing in the world, black chocolate, sugar-free with some mint, and that everyone should enjoy drawing, dancing and reading because that's how you become happy. And um, if you think I'm wrong, please let me know so I can correct my biased ideas. Now you know how to contact me. And if you think that you have a tendency to want to win all your arguments, or you feel like a loser and, you know, that's not very good if you don't win, you feel like rubbish, or do you lose your temper? Do you feel like your blood is boiling if people don't agree with everything you say? Do you storm out or go out crying if people say something you don't like? Maybe you want to get rid of some old and painful memories or fake beliefs that are haunting you in the form of arguments and irritation when others did agree. Because a lot of time, this is nothing to do with logic and a lot to do with the emotions that are there since you were a tiny person. A tiny person that had to be right because he had to defend himself in front of his parents asking for high marks in school, in front of his peers. Who knows, maybe everyone was perfect. But just you, deep inside you, had these issues. So feel free to talk to me. And um, I think I can just leave all these thoughts there because I don't want you to feel like judged or criticized or anything because we all have it as humans. We all tend to, at some point, judge others and say, well, they're wrong. And I'm, I know that I'm right, so they must be wrong. And I do believe there is right and wrong. However, there are many facets and many shades um, I wouldn't say the word grey because it's not appropriate, but uh, shades, you know, light and dark and all sorts. So there, is, there isn't just black and white. And we will talk about black and white thinking in the next episode. But uh, I just want to leave my thoughts for you to have them simmering in your mind for the week thinking, am I doing this when I discuss items I'm like completely closed and I don't want to lose my face? So we'll leave you with two quotes. The first quote is apparently from Thomas Huxley, I have no idea who he is, but there it is. 
and I, I heard this to- this um, this quote literally in 1996. Yeah, as somebody called Richard Bushner. So he said this: "It is not who is right, but what is right. It is of importance." That talk or that sentence was so good that I remembered this for all these years. And the second talk is from Albert Einstein. He said, what is right is not always popular, and what is popular is not always right. So think about it before your next conversation. And that was all for today. I'm so glad that you stay with me for this 26 minutes of transmission. I'm so grateful for all of you guys, listeners. Please write reviews, click like, share, agree with me and disagree with me. That's the whole point of it, to get the debate, get the conversation going. And I really hope that I've been of help. I do have this mission to help everyone create the life they want. And it is done by our action every day. So I hope that you will stay with me in the next episode. And I wish you an amazing summer week. Take care, everyone, and bye-bye. Listen to Create with Franz Sidney.